Hello, welcome to CSC 239, Cyber Law and Ethics. Today we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and we're going to be looking at the case of the Silk Road and Ross Albright. So, before we get really into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, let's talk about the birth of cybersecurity. Operational and policy innovations have developed in response to cybercrime. And again, they're reactive, not proactive, which of course is one of the problems because it's just a matter of the criminals staying one step ahead of the people who are trying to protect the systems. In the 1980s, the Department of Defense had to invent the first computer emergency response team after the Morris worm took down much of the early internet. And remember at this point it was mostly research organizations and universities that had access. Then in the mid 90s Citibank had to invent the role of chief information security officer after a major cyber enabled theft. So even at the beginning the internet, you know, mid 90s there were already people figuring out how to scam the system. And, you know, unfortunately, that's one of the big issues is that for every honest person, there's a scammer who is just as crooked as the other person is honest. So some of the um, security measures in cyberspace that we're going to talk about include firewalls, antivirus software, filtering systems, encryption, the secure socket layer, or SSL, authentication, and digital signatures. So first with the firewall, and this is the first line of defense for most of us, it should prevent intruders from gaining access to the internal network. Firewalls trap an external threat before it can penetrate the system. The simplest version is the packet filter which uses the router to filter packets between the internet network and the external network or the internet. It examines the source address of each packet along with its destination address to determine whether it is trustworthy or not. If it is suspicious it can refuse the packets entry. So in this sense it's that soldier who stands guard at the gate and are you friend or foe and if the pack you know the person responds foe they're of course not going to be let in. Specialized firewalls have been developed to prevent denial of service attacks and that's when a website is inundated with uh, fake customers essentially overwhelming the website and then it just shuts down. The first of these is the trusted guards basically prevent data in theory from moving from one domain to another domain. And number two, a one-way firewall which involves the use of specialized hardware that will literally only transmit data in one direction. They are expensive and they do tend to deep performance, but they are much, much safer. Antiviral anti software, which most of us should have on our computers, this scans computer system for malicious code and deletes that code once it is found. New viruses emerge every day, so antivirus software must be updated frequently. It is estimated that 300 new viruses hit the internet every month, so 10 a day. So when you get those pesky, no annoying little messages about your security needs to be updated, that's what we're talking about. Filtering systems include software like the MIME Sweeper, which scans incoming email for spam and for viruses, while also scanning outgoing mail to ensure that corporate data is not leaving the company. It enhances security, but it also diminishes employee privacy. So, you know, if you work for a defense contractor building a nuclear submarine and you're using top secret documents, obviously if you email those to anyone that will be recorded on software that works like this. Encryption is used to keep information secure while it is being sent from one internet user to another over an open network. 
data is coded and only the authorized recipient can read it because they have the proper key that decodes the information. It has been used for centuries by cryptographers in the sense of making codes and breaking codes. So encryption is something that's been around forever and that key is what's needed. Um, if you ever saw the movie about the um, code breakers at Bletchley and how they basically created this massive computer that would try to figure out the Nazis codes it required both the intellectual ability of several very smart people and also the computing power of a computer and again it's one of the reasons that the Allies won the war and the Nazis ended up in ignominy. so again you know this encryption has been around for a long time it's very important and every time you write something in code to your friends or your sister or your brother that's encryption so the process works like this data is encrypted it is sent from in a form called what we call cipher text and then the recipient decrypts the data to read it using the key or the decoding pattern the standard today for private encryption is a 128 bit algorithm which is considered somewhat unbreakable so let's say you're using a 128 bit AES cipher the number of possible keys with 128 bits is 2 raised to the power of 128 or 3.4 times 1038 or 340 undecillion which is basically a one with 36 zeros after it assuming no information on the nature of the key is available such as the fact that the owner likes to use his or her children's birthdays a code breaking attempt would require testing each possible key until one was found that worked assuming that enough computing power was amassed to test one trillion keys per second testing all possible keys would take 10.79 quintillion years this is about 785 million times the age of the visible universe which is uh, just under 14 billion years so you know theoretically these encryption programs should not be easily broken unfortunately with humans involved we always use numbers that mean something to us that have some sort of resonant power which is why inevitably they can crack the codes the SSL or secure socket layer is used in most financial transactions online it is the standard security technology for establishing an encrypted link between a web server and a browser this link ensures that all data passed between the web server and browsers remain private and integral this is a form of encryption that prevents credit card information and other personal information from being accessed to be able to set up an SSL connection a web server requires an SSL certificate when you activate SSL on your web server you will be prompted to complete a number of questions about the identity of your website and your company the web server then creates two cryptographic keys a private key and a public key public key encryption uses two different keys at once a combination of a private key and a public key the private key is known only to your computer while the public key is given by your computer to any other computer that wants to communicate securely with it to decode an encrypted message a computer must use the public key provided by the originating computer and its own private key although a message sent from one computer to another won't be secure since the public key used for encryption is published and available to anyone anyone who picks it up can't read it without the private key so again these encryption methodologies are meant to deter delay anyone from being able to access private information then we have authentication and we see this all the time it is used to establish a secure transaction on the internet 
It involves the security system validating the identity of a user using credentials that have been validated previously. Moving on to digital signatures, this is a private key is used to sign one signature to some message or piece of data and a public key is used to verify a signature after it has been sent. And again, this is a matter of uh, specific codes or encryption information that theoretically will prevent anyone from getting your information. So the government response to encryption is it wants to have a back door to any system that deals with international communications on the internet. In other words, they want to measure, they want some measure of control over the public and private keys. The government claims it is to assist in law enforcement if a terrorist should gain access to these encryption systems. One of the biggest issues that we deal with today is how much can the government know about us? You have the people on one end of a continuum who want to live off the grid. They don't want anyone to know anything about them. You know, they don't have phones. They don't have any electric bills. You know, they live in the woods, kind of doing their man in the, in the middle of nowhere kind of thing. And, and, you know, and these folks are the one extreme. On the other extreme is the, the government, which really wants to have access to any information that it would like without necessarily having to pursue all the warrants and everything necessary. So this all goes back to 1993. And remember, this is a couple years before the Internet really hit commercially. The NSA, or the National Security agency developed an encryption system called the Clipper Chip in 1993. It was an encoded algorithm known as Skipjack, which gave law enforcement officials access to all encrypted systems. Two different government agencies each hold half of the binary encryption code. With a court order, law enforcement can access both halves to spy on communications between sus suspects. And, you know, at this point, the public is not happy. You know, civil libertarians in particular say this is an assault on our privacy rights. You know, we all kind of joke that our cell phone data and our television viewing habits are all being monitored by the government. And you know, the reality is that it probably is. And that's not even being paranoid anymore. In 1996, the government issued a third encryption plan called the Key Management Infrastructure. It authorized government infrastructure to have key recovery services. This required companies to have a plan in place that shows how the decryption key was stored and agree that they would turn it over if presented with a warrant. So we're kind of moving more towards, you know, court orders now. And again, what we look at here is, you know, what is this relative to? And is this a significant enough issue that the information should be shared? And again, you have folks who truly believe that the government has no business being in their business and as such should not have access to their information. So in 2000, President Clinton gave companies the option of using a private third-party company to hold the halves of the binary encryption. The rule also barred companies for doing encryption business with any country that supported terrorism, such as North Korea and Iraq. So, you know, this country, which is based on the idea of capitalism, not democracy, but capitalism, really looks for ways to privatize every kind of governmental agency in order to theoretically make it more efficient. Well, the reality is, is that's not exactly how it works. But these third party companies now have also contributed to the fact that we keep getting hacked left, right and center. In 2013, the issue of government spying hit the news in a big way. 
an NSA contractor, Edward Snowden, that's the guy on the right, revealed 200,000 documents that prove that the government was essentially collecting millions of pieces of information from our phones and computers. These documents also showed that the USA not only spies on their own allies, but taps the phones of the leaders of these other countries. Uh, Brazil was one of the ones that was really just seriously annoyed and angry when this was discovered because they were tapping the personal phone of the president at the time. In October 2013, the director of the NSA, General Keith Alexander, admitted to secret pilot programs to monitor the precise location of Americans through their cell phones, saying the highly intrusive tracking data may be something that is a future requirement for the country. So the NSA has been working on this way to track us all using our cell phones, which, you know, our, our, we don't make it any harder for them because we have all our locations turned on and, um, you know, people can ping us. There's all kinds of ways of figuring out where we are based on the cell phone towers. And again, people who are not real big fans of the government, not real happy with something like this. In December 2013, it was revealed that the National Security Agency is reportedly collecting almost 5 billion cell phone records a day, a day, under a program that monitors and analyzes highly personal data about the precise whereabouts of individuals wherever they travel in the world. And they track the cell phones via the cell phone towers. And each tower has a particular range and area. So it can literally track your, your transportation from one location to the next based on when your cell phone is pinging off these towers. And for those of you who may uh, follow true crime, a lot of times this is how they track people and are either able to convict or eliminate them from the investigation based on where their cell phone is at a particular time. Defending the program, U.S. officials told the news media that efforts to collect and analyze location data are lawful and intended strictly to develop intelligence about foreign targets, with information about the location of domestic cell phones only gathered incidentally. So again, it's we're spying, but you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, we're not going to be worried about you. And this really does kind of move towards a more fascist perspective on the government is watching us. You know, and those of you who may be of a more literary bent, if you've ever read George Orwell's 1984, these particular um, listening in and gathering of data is especially worrisome. So, I'm going to then move on now to a case study called Silk Road. And this is one of those stories where there's no victims per se and there's no heroes. It's just a really convoluted situation that has ultimately led to many people questioning how the FBI, DEA, Homeland Security engages with um, the internet and on the other side of the coin, you know, what privacy or freedoms do we really have? So in 2011, the Silk Road website was launched on the dark web and the dark web is of course um, the web that is not indexed and it's got, it's where people go for all kinds of unsavory issues, child or child pornography, primarily weapon um, selling, drugs, everything you can think of. The site, Silk Road, was modeled on an eBay type platform, but instead of selling baseball cards and other collectibles, sellers on Silk Road were offering drugs to potential customers. Silk Road was created by Ross William Ulbrich, an Eagle Scout who earned a full scholarship to the University of Te Texas to study physics, so clearly a smart guy. And there he is on the right. Once he finished his bachelor's degree, he was offered a scholarship to pursue a master's degree in material science and engineering at Penn State, and he graduated in 2009. So what did he do between 2009 and 2011? Well, 
First, at Penn State, Ulbricht joined a student political group that promoted libertarianism, a movement closely aligned with ethical egoism, if we go back to our ethics. Libertarians believe that the scope and powers of government should be limited. They also endorse civil liberties, non-interventionism, meaning anti-war, laissez-faire capitalism, meaning less regulation, and the abolishment of the social welfare programs such as um, food stamps and CHIP, you know, hospital, uh, medical care for children. They believe that individuals should be free to behave and to use their property as they see fit, provided that their actions do not infringe on the equal freedom of others. It sounds good, it's just not as practical as you might think because when you start talking about things like taking medical care away from children there just does seem to be a feeling that we're taking advantage of a vulnerable population that can't even vote for itself. So after finishing his master's degree Albrecht tried a few entrepreneurial opportunities conducting day trading in the stock market and teaching himself how to code to build an online used bookstore. Unfortunately, neither of these were very successful. In 2010, running out of money, Albrecht taught himself how to code and program and started to build what would become Silk Road. And there is his LinkedIn profile from prior to the Silk Road. The idea Albrecht wrote in his journal was to create a website where people could buy anything anonymously with no trail whatsoever that could lead back to them. Like most libertarians, Ross believed that drug use was a personal choice, so his focus was on creating a drug marketplace. His plan would be implemented using two different technologies. Tor, which we've talked about, that's the anonymizer for your IP address, and Bitcoin. And again, Tor is the protocol that encrypts data and routes internet traffic through intermediary servers that anonymize IP addresses before reaching a final destination. This would keep Albright's identity a secret. Bitcoin is a new currency that was created in 2009 by an unknown person using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto. Transactions were made with no middlemen, meaning no banks, and so Bitcoins could be used to buy products anonymously. With no banks comes no regulations, and this new concept of cryptocurrency is still, you know, seven, eight, nine years later, creating confusion because people just don't understand how it works. It is mostly unregulated, but some countries like Japan, China, and Australia have begun thinking about putting regulations on Bitcoin. Governments are concerned about taxation and their lack of control over the currency. So they're not trying to necessarily protect the consumer, they're trying to protect their ability to collect taxes. The Silk Road was designed to be a well-organized community marketplace, complete with profiles, product listings, and transaction reviews. So if you've ever been on eBay or Amazon, it'll look awfully familiar. Everything was anonymous and shipments often went through the regular postal services and they used vacuum packing and different um, packaging materials to prevent any uh, odors being caught by the um, drug dogs that are usually hanging out in and around these place uh, postal areas. The other thing that was very interesting with regard to this is that um, when the Silk Road website hit, there was an immediate understanding of how it worked. We have become so well trained by the internet we already use that there was a significant number of people who, you know, they got it. They got it easily. Also, um, after Silk Road launched, they estimated that more than 80% of the product that was sent out reached the person who ordered it. So you had a pretty good chance of getting the drugs you ordered. There was no easy way to find websites on the dark web. The URLs tend to be a random collection of numbers and letters. 
Albrecht targeted chat rooms in the regular part of the web that catered to libertarians and drug users, casually mentioning Silk Road and a website that provided instructions on how to access the real site on the dark web. And this drove traffic to the dark website almost immediately. You know, if you are somebody who enjoys your cocaine on the weekend um, and you don't want to have to deal with the underbelly of drug dealers, going online and ordering it from a website that works very much like Amazon just seemed like a really preferable methodology for a lot of these people who used uh, the substances. As the site flourished, Albrecht realized that his former girlfriend and another friend both knew he created the site, and he wanted to distance himself from being identified as the creator. He told both he had sold the site to another individual. Then, taking a page from the movie and book Princess Bride, he called himself the Dread Pirate Roberts, which was a title that was passed down to a successor when the person made their fortune and left the pirating business. No one ever knew who the first Dread Pirate Roberts was. Needless to say, the Silk Road was an immediate success, and growth was exponential. So, for example, in December of 2011, Ross was estimating that the site was making about a half a million dollars per month. Three months later, March 2012, the drug sales had topped two million per month and of course he was taking his cut right off the top the site contained dozens of categories with thirteen thousand listings including heroin cocaine ecstasy mdma lsd mushrooms as well as pharmaceuticals such as oxycodone and fentanyl and of course uh... the devil's lettuce was also being sold there so, as Silk Road grew, so did its reputation, which alerted various agencies to this drug market. The DEA, the FBI, Homeland Security, and the IRS were getting into the business of paying attention. At the same time, Albrecht discovered that one of the users had stolen $350,000 in Bitcoin from the website escrow account. Also, one of the sellers on the Silk Road had been arrested, and there was a concern that he would sing like a canary. So, Ross decided to take action. He manages the problem through what we like to call delegation. First, he hired some real programmers to tighten up the website security. And for these folks, he went to the dark web, into the Silk Road um, discussion boards, and found out who were professional programmers because they like drugs too. He then contracted with one of his sellers to hire a hitman to kill one of the to kill the man who had been arrested. Albrick went on to hire four more hits on various enemies, including people who had tried to blackmail him or people who had um, stolen Bitcoin from him. Although he was sent pictures of corpses, the so-called hitman never actually killed anyone because the seller he hired was actually an undercover agent. So, you know, obviously here there's that intent to kill, but he never actually got had it carried, but he didn't know that. And this is going to become important at the end when things start to hit the fan, so to speak. Meanwhile, back at the FBI, after months of trying various technologies, the FBI was finally able to identify the real IP address of Ross Ulbrich. This led them to San Francisco, where Homeland Security questioned Ross Ulbrich, who admitted to buying a false ID. And there, on the right-hand side, are some of the false IDs he purchased. Other agents were undercover as buyers on Silk Road and began dr buying drugs under a pseudonym. So you have an undercover seller, undercover buyers, and you have... Homeland Security sniffing around. So, you know, at this point, Ross Ulbrich has every right to be as paranoid as possible. So, in addition to the undercover agents, the FBI and DEA had also hacked into the code of Silk Road, as well as accessing chat logs that Ulbrich maintained. 1,400 pages of conversations he had about the drug empire he was running. One of the chats discovered detailed the haggling over the price of killing a user who was trying to blackmail Ulbrich. 
And here's one of the guys, Curtis Green, who was uh, one of the men that Ulbricht put a hit out on and who participated in the ruse that he was murdered to avoid actually getting murdered. The Silk Road servers had a login system that created one trusted computer for all other machines. Its encryption keys all ended with Frosty at Frosty. This meant that these computers shared one key friend, a single machine they could all talk to. An IRS agent who was working on the case, keeping an eye out for Frosty, saw a user transition from his Gmail address to the Frosty handle before his eyes. It was Ross Ulbricht's Gmail account he had seen. So even the smartest of us still forget sometimes to log out of our Gmail. They discovered that Ulbricht was the same person who had been questioned earlier about the fake IDs. Agents started surveillance on him and discovered that other than sitting at home, he seemed to only leave the house regularly to go to a cafe down the street or the park across the street. The agents then lined up Ross's internet usage with the Dread Pirate Roberts activity on Silk Road. The activity matched. Every time Ross turned on his computer, the Dread Pirate Robert logged on to Silk Road. When he closed it, the Dread Pirate Robert logged out. Over weeks of surveillance, the pattern was consistent. The FBI and DEA wanted to get Ross in medias re, with fingers on the key, so to speak, caught in the act. They had read in DP, uh, Dread Pirate Robert's chats about how secure his system was and how one keystroke could erase everything. On October 1, 2013, the surveillance team watched Albrecht go from his house to the cafe, but he left because it was crowded. Instead, he went to the public library that was next to the cafe. The agents followed him in and got into position. As Ross Albrecht tapped away on his laptop, a loud argument broke out between a man and a woman behind him, and this was a setup, and the participants were agents. When Ulbricht turned around to see what the ruckus was about, the FBI and DEA immediately seized his open laptop, which secured all of the data and prevented Ulbricht from wiping out his information. Ulbricht was cuffed, taken to a police cruiser, and agents confirmed that he was logged in as the Dread Pirate Roberts. Then the FBI took the site down and replaced it with the image on the right. So there you go. After a relatively quick 13-day trial and four hours of deliberation by the jury, which also, by the way, included them having lunch, Albrecht was convicted of money laundering, computer hacking, conspiracy to traffic fraudulent identity documents, and, and this is the big one, conspiracy to traffic narcotics, and this was in February 2015. Prosecutors decided not to pursue charges related to the murders for hire because no one was actually murdered. However, these actions were heavily emphasized during the penalty phase of the trial, which led to Ulbricht being given a life sentence without the possibility of parole, meaning Ross Ulbricht is going to sit in prison every day for the rest of his life, and he will never once go up before the parole board. Additionally, the U.S. government seized $28.5 million from Ulbricht's accounts. In 2016, Albrecht appealed his sentence as being too harsh. It was upheld by the appeals court, and the court said, in light of the overwhelming evidence discussed below that Albrecht was prepared, like other drug king kingpins, to protect his profits by paying large sums of money to have individuals who threatened his enterprise murdered, it would be plainly wrong to conclude that he was sentenced for accidental deaths that the district court discussed only in passing in imposing a sentence. And then there they're referring to people who may have overdosed while buying drugs on Silk Road. So essentially what the appeals court is saying is, just like any other drug kingpin, this guy was willing to have other people murdered to protect his website and his money and his profits. Which, by the way, goes against the whole libertarian idea of not hurting anyone else or infringing on anyone else's um, sensibilities or freedom. In December 2017, Albrecht filed an appeal with the Supreme Court. 
The Supreme Court has postponed hearing his appeal until the matter of Carpenter v. U.S. is resolved. This case involves the collection of cell phone location data as a part of an investigation and whether it can be used in court. So, you know, that checking cell phone pings and what towers, which is used extensively in criminal investigations, is now being questioned as whether or not it is uh, privacy and therefore a violation of our constitutional rights or a valid way to collect evidence. So there's the work cited. Now, before I let you go, there's a couple things. First, there is a huge movement to have Ross Ulbricht's sentence reduced because they're saying, well, he didn't actually kill anyone. And more importantly, he is a um, intelligent guy who should be given, you know, who's going to pay his debt to society. But when he's older, maybe we should let him out. So there's that. Uh, the other thing is what it does is it really examines the ingenuity of people who are looking to get rich and the internet is an unfathomable boundaries of potential. You know, the dark web has horrible things on it, but the indexed web also has horrible things on it. So, you know, we are looking at a future where we just don't know how we can truly manage the websites beyond the idea of instituting code to prevent crimes or to stop crimes from occurring. So in this term, or in this sense, Ross Ulbricht's case really does form the, the frame of how we have to look at cybercrime and how it has to be managed. You know, if this was some drug dealer who was part of the Crips or the Bloods who, you know, had a bunch of his enemies killed, we would be like, yeah, put him in jail forever. But this guy sat at a laptop and coded his crimes. So what's the difference? And that is where we end the course in a sense because we don't know where the future is going, if code will be able to stop it, or if the internet will be so commodified that poor people won't even be able to afford it anymore. So from there, we end. If you have any questions, please email or text me. If you're not us, but you have a question, please leave a comment and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you and have a fabulous day.